Once in a while, I get people that really that, or that claim they don't believe in evolution. And my response generally is, well, why not? Really, why not? You guys believe 20 billion years ago there was a big bang where nothing exploded and produced everything. 4.6 billion years ago the earth cooled down, made a hard rocky crust, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. Found somebody to marry, and something to eat of course, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. There are some lies in our science books. I taught it for 15 years. Even though I'm not teaching it anymore, I still like to study. It's so many neat things to learn. And we're going to cover some of that tonight. Now, I'm not against science. I'm not against schools. I'm not against teachers. Because most of them don't know what they believe. You have to tell them. They teach the kids it all started with the Big Bang 20 billion years ago. What exploded? <laughs> this is what the textbooks teach. Before the Big Bang, there was nothing, literally nothing, an infinitesimal nugget of space. And then something happened triggering the most colossal explosion in history. What? Yes, boys and girls, you see, nothing exploded, and uh, here we are. So I asked this professor if I could ask him some questions about the Big Bang. I said, where did all this matter come from? He said, well, we don't know that for sure. I said, well, sir, would you please tell me where the laws came from? The universe is run by laws, gravity, centrifugal force, inertia. Who gave the laws? He said, we don't know that either. I said, sir, could you tell me where the energy came from? You know, it takes energy to make a Big Bang. Who bought the gas to run this machine anyway? Hmm? He said, we don't know that either. I said, uh, sir, could I ask you another question? He said, sure. What else would you like to know? <laughs> uh, else? What do you mean else? You haven't told me nothing yet. I said, does Berkeley have a merry-go-round? You see, if a spinning object breaks apart in a frictionless environment, the fragments will all spin the same direction. The professor said, yes, I understand about the conservation of angular momentum. I said, well, good. I'd like to ask you a question then, sir. If the whole universe began as a swirling dot, like you said, why do two planets spin backwards? He said, that's interesting. I said, no, that's more than interesting. It's kind of hard on your Big Bang Theory. Not only that, six of the moons are spinning backwards. Why? He said, I don't know. Why do you think they're going backwards? I was hoping he was going to ask that. I said, okay, now, sir, hold it. If I told you that I believe God created the heaven and the earth like the Bible teaches, you're going to say, and where did God come from? And I don't know. But you said, well, we don't know that for sure. We don't know that either. We don't don't tell me either. my theory is religious and yours is science. Oh, no, sir, they're both religious. Evolution is a religion. You have to believe. So I asked the professor, where did the matter come from? He said, I don't know. So basically, I believe in the beginning God and you believe in the beginning dirt. One professor was getting kind of upset about this time. He said, uh, Mr. Hoven, there are hundreds of varieties of dogs in the world. He said, do you mean to tell me that you believe all these dogs came from two dogs off of Noah's Ark? You expect me to believe that? I said, sir, would you look at what you're teaching your students? You're teaching your students that all the dogs in the world came from a rock. <laughs> Charles Darwin was disciplined. I mean, he did these extraordinary experiments, this series of experiments. Then they're going to tell the kids, well, we have evidence for this theory. Charlie Darwin stopped off at these islands right there called the Galapagos Islands. Charlie studied the birds very carefully and said, you know what? I think all these birds had a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. You see 14 kinds of birds, and you conclude that birds and bananas are related. Here are these ancient dinosaur bones or fossils. They tell the kids they have evidence of evolution from fossils. I don't think so. If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You don't know that it had any kids. And you sure don't know that it had different kids. You bring in a bone to the judge. Judge, I found this bone in the dirt. This is the ancestor of all the humans today. <laughs> they would laugh at you. You don't know that that's the ancestor of anybody. And why on earth would you think a bone in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do? They'll say, boys and girls, you have two bones in your wrist, radius and ulna. And boys and girls, look at the whale's flipper carefully. Did you know the whale has two bones in his flipper? And they're called the radius and the ulna? Same as ours. Wow. Who named them, teacher? The whale? <laughs> Think about it. Evolution say people came from monkeys. And the question is, why is there still monkeys? Is these the retarded monkeys? They didn't turn into people just yet. Even Stephen Gould admitted the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages is a persistent and nagging problem for evolution. 
See, what's happened, these guys have looked for missing links in the, in the fossil record. They can't find any. And so they say, well, maybe evolution happened so fast it wasn't preserved. Maybe a reptile laid an egg and a bird hatched out. Well, who did that bird marry? This process that brought us to be is billions of years old. It happens very fast, billions of years fast. Here is um, radioactivity. We're going to tell the kids in the late 1940s, they invented carbon dating. We're going to explain a little bit about radiometric dating and how it's supposed to work, and then show you that it does not work, OK? It sounds good, but there are some assumptions that mess everything up. If we had walked into a room and found a candle burning on the table, and I asked you the question, when was it lit? You said, I don't know, Mr. Holman, it's burning when I got here. Okay, well then, let's do some empirical science. Let's measure the height of the candle. Suppose the candle is seven inches tall. Who can tell me when it was lit? Okay, nobody. Let's do some more empirical science. Let's measure the rate of burn. Suppose we determine it's burning an inch an hour. When was it lit? You're going to have a hard time telling me unless you're willing to make some assumptions. You find a fossil in the dirt, you can measure how much C14 is in it. Very accurately, by the way. And you can measure how fast it's decaying. That's just like measuring the height of your candle and how fast it's burning. Now, when did that animal die? You don't have a clue. Here's what you ought to consider about carbon dating. Samples of known age, it doesn't work. If it's a sample of unknown age, it is assumed to work. It's just really a hard thing. It's, it's really a hard thing. Your world just becomes fantastically complicated when you don't believe in evolution. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. Shells from living snails, carbon dated 27,000 years old. Living penguins, carbon dated 8,000 years old. One part of Dima was 40,000 years old, another part was 26,000, and the wood next to it is 9,000. Then they tell the kids about the geologic column. They say each of the layers is a different age, you know, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic, all them Zoic boys. Now, if you get a petrified tree standing up, running through different rock layers, I don't think it's smart to say those layers are vastly different ages. Those trees did not get slowly covered by the sediments over millions of years. They would rot and fall down. Uh, crazy. I just, uh, They'll say, boys and girls, you have an appendix that you don't need anymore. That's a vestigial structure. That's proof of evolution. Well, excuse me, you do need your appendix. The appendix is part of your immune system. If your appendix is taken out, you can still live, okay, but it increases your susceptibility to quite a few diseases. You can live without both your legs and both your arms and both your eyes also. That doesn't prove you don't need them. There are no vestigial organs, and even if there were, that would be the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. I was taught when I went to school, man used to have a tail, but he lost it because he didn't need it. I thought, didn't need it? Have you ever thought how handy a tail would be? <laughs> Have you ever come to the door with two sacks of groceries? Wouldn't that be nice, man, be able to grab that door and walk right around and get in it? <laughs> Lost it because we didn't need it. Man, you could drive the car and tune the radio knob and hold the Coke at the same time. What we're finding is that natural selection seems to be an incredibly important factor in generating new species. Natural selection the key evolutionary mechanism Darwin identified. The bad designs get eaten by the good ones, and so all you have is good ones. Why is there still monkeys? Natural selection doesn't cause any evolution. It makes sure the bad ones don't survive, but it's not going to change it to something else. That's what evolution is. If you worked in a factory that produced cars, and your job was to check for defects, and you caught every single mistake, and you rejected it, how long would it take that process to change the car to an airplane? He said, it'll never change it. <laughs> That's my point. The students are taught we have evidence from development. Darwin considered this by far the strongest single class of evidence. This textbook says, the human embryo growing in the mother has gills like a fish. Those little folds of skin are not gills. Those little wrinkles under your chin when you're growing up later develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. I've seen folks that have five or six chins and they can't breathe through any of them but the top one. <laughs> Those are not gill slits. Ernst Haeckel, though, said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Darwin's book. He made huge charts of his posters of his drawings of these embryos and traveled all over Germany and just about by himself converted the Germans to believing in evolution. 
Haeckel took a drawing of a dog and a human embryo and he changed them to make them look exactly alike. On top are Haeckel's fake drawings, underneath are actual photographs of what he claimed he was drawing a picture of. Now either he's a lousy artist or he's a liar. Well, it turns out he's a liar. He was convicted of fraud by his own university, proven to be a fraud. But guess what? Haeckel's fake drawings are still used in textbooks in your state right now. It's only been proven wrong 125 years ago. I know it takes a while to get textbooks up to date, but that ought to be plenty of time. Adolf Hitler said, you let me control the textbooks, I'll control the state. Watch this sentence here carefully. Some kid's doing this for homework tonight. Boys and girls, do you think humans are still evolving? Now what kind of question is that? Doesn't that question assume that evolution has happened? What if a kid doesn't believe in evolution? How is he supposed to do his homework tonight? That question does not teach him how to think critically. That teaches him what to think, not how to think. And when the kid gets done with this course, he's going to think he knows how to think. But he doesn't. He knows how to be told what to think. Brainwashing at taxpayer expense. They want to use my tax dollars to teach that to your kids in our schools. If you want to deny evolution, that's fine. But don't make your kids do it, because we need them. And that's where the problem comes in. Okay? If you want to believe in the Big Bang, just enjoy yourself, but keep your religion at home. The Russian atheist astronomer came to America and spoke at one of the universities, and he said, started off his speech. He said, folks, either there is a God or there isn't. Both possibilities are frightening. If there is no God, we're in trouble. We're hurtling through space around the sun right now at 66,000 miles an hour, and nobody's in charge. <laughs> That's a scary thought. But if God made the world, he owns it. That means he makes the rules. You see, if there is a God, we better find out who he is and find out what he wants and do what he says. Malcolm Muggeridge said, I am convinced the theory of evolution, especially the extent to which it's been applied, will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future.